Friends, we are starting the channel Books of the World in English with the most wise and spiritual book ever written by people, and this is not only in our opinion, many spiritual teachers say the same. For example the well-known Guru Asho says this about this book. The Book of Murdered is one of my favorites, it is one of those books that will live forever, if I had to make a list of great books I would put it first. Therefore, those who love Asho's books and lectures should already read, but today we want to share with you this incredible book, which can truly be called the most useful self-development book on earth. Don't forget to subscribe, afterwards the wisest and most spiritual books from the greatest authors await you every day. And now buckle up, sit back and we'll begin. Part 1. The Bound Abbot. In the Milky Mountains, upon the lofty summit known as Altar Peak, stand the spacious and somber ruins of a monastery once famous as the Ark. Traditions would link it with an antiquity so hoary as the Flood. Numerous legends have been woven about the Ark, but the one most current on the tongues of local mountaineers among whom I chance to spend a certain summer in the shade of Alter Peak is the following. Many years after the great deluge Noah and his family, and his family's increase, drifted into the Milky Mountains, where they found fertile valleys, abundant streams and a most equable climate there they decided to settle. When Noah felt his days drawing to an end he called unto him his son Sam who was a dreamer and a man of vision like himself, and spoke unto him saying, Behold, my son, your father's harvest of years has been exceedingly rich. Now is the last sheaf ready for the sickle. You and your brothers, and your children and your children's children shall repeople the bereaved earth, and your seed shall be as the sand of the sea according to God's promise to me, yet a certain fear besets my flickering days. It is that men shall in time forget the flood and the lusts and wickedness that brought it on. They shall also forget the ark and the faith that bore it in triumph for the fifty and one hundred days over the furies of the revengeful deeps. Nor shall they be mindful of the new life that issued of that faith whereof they shall be the fruit, lest they forget, I bid you, my son, to build an altar upon the highest peak in these mountains, which peak shall henceforth be known as Altar Peak. I bid you further build an house around that altar, which house shall correspond in all details to the ark, but in much reduced dimensions, and shall be known as the ark. Upon that altar I propose to offer my last thanks offering. And from the fire I shall kindle thereon I bid you keep a light perpetually burning. As to the house, you shall make of it a sanctuary for a small community of chosen men whose number shall never exceed nine, nor ever be less than nine. They shall be known as Ark Companions. When one of them dies, God will immediately provide another in his stead. They shall not leave the sanctuary, but shall be cloistered therein all their days, practicing all the austerities of the Mother Ark, keeping the fire of faith burning and calling unto the highest for guidance to themselves and to their fellowmen. Their bodily needs shall be provided them by the charity of the faithful. Sam, who had hung upon each syllable of his father's words, interrupted him to know the reason for the number nine no more, no less. And the age burden patriarch explaining said. That is, my son, the number of those who sailed the ark. But Sam could count no more than eight, his father and mother, himself and his wife, and his tow brothers and their wives. Therefore was he much perplexed at his father's words. And Noah, perceiving his son's perplexity, explained further. Behold, I revealed unto you a great secret, my son. The ninth person was a stowaway, known and seen by me alone. He was my constant companion and my helmsman. Ask me no more of him, but fail not to make room for him in your sanctuary. These are my wishes, Sam, my son see you to them. And Sam did according to his father commanded. When Noah was gathered unto his fathers, his children buried him under the altar in the ark which for ages thereafter continued to be, indeed and in spirit, the very sanctuary conceived and ordained by the venerable conqueror of the flood. In the course of centuries, 
However the Ark began by and by to accept donations from the faithful far in excess of its needs, as a result it grew richer and richer every year in lands in sliver and gold, and in precious stones. A few generations ago, when one of the nine had just passed away a stranger came to the gates and asked to be admitted into the community, according to the ancient traditions of the Ark which had never been violated the stranger should have been accepted at once being the first to ask for admittance immediately following upon a companion's death. But the senior, as the abbot of the Ark was called, chanced at the time to be a willful, worldly-minded and hard-hearted man. He did not like the stranger's appearance who was naked, famished and covered with wounds, and he told him that he was unworthy of admittance into the community. The stranger insisted on being admitted, and his insistence on his part so infuriated the senior that he bade him leave the grounds in haste. But the stranger was persuasive and would not be sent away. In the end he prevailed upon the senior to take him as a servant. Long did the senior wait thereafter upon providence to send a companion in place of the one who died, but no man came. Thus for the first time in the history the ark housed eight companions and a servant. Seven years passed and the monastery grew so rich that no ones could assess its riches. It owned all the lands and villages for miles and miles about. The senior was very happy and became well disposed towards the stranger, believing him to have brought good luck to the ark. At the dawn of the eighth year however things began to change swiftly. The erstwhile peaceful community was in ferment. The clever senior soon divined that the stranger was the cause and decided to put him out, but alas it was too late, the monks under his leadership were no longer amenable to any rule or reason, in two years they gave away all the properties of the monastery, and what is more horrifying the stranger laid a curse upon the senior whereby he is bound to the grounds of the monastery and made dumb until this day. Thus runs the legend, 7 There is no dearth of eyewitnesses who assured me that on many occasions sometimes by day and sometimes by night they had seen the senior wandering about the grounds of the deserted and now much ruined monastery, yet none was ever able to force a single word out of his lips. Moreover each time he felt the presence of any man or woman he would quickly disappear no one knew where. I confess that this story robbed me of my rest, the vision of a solitary monk or even his shadow wandering for many years in and about the courts of so ancient a sanctuary, upon a peak so desolate as Altar Peak was too haunting to chase away. It teased my eyes, it smote my thoughts, it lashed my blood. It goaded my flesh and bone. At last I said I would ascend the mountain. Part 2. Flint Slope. Facing the sea to the west, and rising many thousands of feet above it with a front broad steep and craggy altar peak appeared from a distance defying the forbidding, yet to reasonable safe accesses, were pointed out to me both tortuous narrow paths and skirting many precipices one from the south another from the north. I decided to take neither. Between the two descending directly from the summit and reaching almost to its very base I could discern a narrow smooth-faced slope which appeared to me as the road royal to the peak. It attracted me with an uncanny force, and I determined to make it my road. When I revealed my determination to one of the local mountaineers he fixed me with two flaming eyes and striking his hands together shouted in terror, Flint Slope never be so foolish as to give your life away so cheap, many have attempted it before you, but none ever returned to tell the tale, Flint Slope? Never never. With this he insisted on guiding me up the mountain, but I politely declined his help. I cannot explain why his terror had a reverse effect on me, instead of deterring me, it spurred me on and fixed me firmer than before in my purpose. Of a certain morn just as darkness was graying into light I shook the night's dreams off my eyelids, and grasping my staff with seven loaves of bread I struck for flint slope. The low breath of the expiring night the quick pulse of the day, being born a gnawing longing to face the mystery of the bound monk, and a still more gnawing one to unyoke myself from myself at least for a moment, 
No matter how brief seemed to lend wings to my feet and buoyancy to my blood, I began my journey with a song in my heart and a firm determination in my soul. But when after a long and joyous march I reached the lower end of the slope and attempted to scale it with my eyes I quickly swallowed my song. What appeared to me from a distance a straight smooth ribbon-like roadbed now stretched before me broad and steep and high and unconquerable. So far as my eye could reach upward and sideward I could not see nothing but broken flint of various sizes and shapes the smallest chip a sharp needle or a wetted blade, not a trace of life anywhere, a shroud so somber as to be awe-inspiring hung over all the landscape about while the summit was not to be glimpsed, yet would I not be deterred. With the eyes of the good man who warned me against the slope still flaming on my face I called my determination froth and began my upward march, soon however I realized that my feet alone could advance me no great distance, for the flint kept slipping from under them creating a horrific sound like a million throats laboring in a death throttle, to make any headway I had to dig my hands and knees as well as my toes in the mobile flint, how I wished then I had the agility of a goat. Up and up I crawled in a zigzag giving myself no rest, for I began to fear that night would overtake me before I reached my goal, to retreat was far from my mind. The day was well nigh spent, when I felt a sudden attack of hunger. Till then, I had no, though a food or drink. The loaves of bread, which I had tied in a handkerchief about my waist, were too precious indeed, to be valued at that moment. I untied them, and was about to break the first morsel, when the sound of a bell, and what seemed like the wailing of a reed flute struck my ears. Nothing could be more startling in that flint hoof desolation. Presently, I saw a great black bell wither appear on a ridge to my right. Before I could catch my breath, goats surrounded me on all sides, and flint crashing under their feet as under mine, but producing a much less horrifying sound. As through by invitation, the goats, led by the weather, dashed at my bread and would have snatched it from my hands, had it not been for the voice of their shepherd who I know not how and whence appeared to be at my elbow. He was a youth of striking appearance, tall, strong and radiant. A loinskin was his only raiment and the reed flute in his hand his only weapon. My bellwither is a spoiled goat, said he softly and smilingly. I feed him bread whenever I have it. But no bread-eating creature has passed here in many many moons. Then turning to his leading goat do you see how good fortune provides, my faithful bellwither? Never despair of fortune. Whereupon, he reached down and took a loaf. Believing that he was hungry, I said to him very gently and very sincerely, we will share this frugal meal. There is enough bread for both of us and for the bellwither. To my almost paralyzing astonishment he threw the first loaf to the goats, then the second and third, and so until the seventh, taking a bite of each for himself. I was thunderstruck and anger began to tear my chest. Yet realizing my helplessness, I quitted my anger in a measure, and turning a puzzled eye upon the goatherd said half begging, half reproaching, now that you have fed a hungry man's bread to your goats, would you not feed him some of their milk? My goat's milk is poison to fools, and I would not have any of my goats guilty of taking even a fool's life. But wherein am I a fool? In that you take seven loaves of bread for a seven lives journey, should I have taken seven thousand then? Not even one, to go provision less on such a long journey, is that what you advise? The way that proves, not for the wayfarer is no way to far upon, would you have me eat flint for bread and drink my sweat for water? Your flesh is food sufficient and your blood is drink sufficient. There is the way besides, you mock me goatherd over much. Yet would I not return your mockery? Whoever eats of my bread, although he leave me famished the same becomes my brother, the day is slipping down the mountain, 
and I must be on my way, would you not tell me, if I be still far from the summit? You are too near oblivion, with this he put the flute to his lips, and marched off to the weird notes of a tune which wounded like a plane from the nether worlds. The bellwether followed, and after him the rest of the goats, for a long space I could hear the crashing of the flint, and the bleeding of the goats mixed with the wailing of the flute, having entirely forgotten my hunger I began to rebuild, what the goatherd had destroyed of my energy and determination, if night were to find me in that dismal mass of flowing flint I must seek me a place, where I could stretch my tired bones without fear of rolling down the slope, so I resumed my crawling, looking down the mountain I could hardly believe that I had risen so high, the lower end of the slope was no longer in sight, while the summit seemed almost within reach, by nightfall I came to a group of rocks forming a kind of grotto, although the grotto overhung an abyss whose bottom heaved with dreary dark shadows I decided to make it my lodging for the night, my footgear was in shreds and heavily strained with blood, as I attempted to remove it, I found that my skin had clung to it tightly as if glued, the palms of my hands were covered with red furrows, the nails were like the edge of a bark torn off a dead tree, my clothes had donated their better parts to the sharp flints, my head was swelling with sleep, it seemed to contain no, though of anything else, how long had I been asleep, a moment an hour or an eternity? I do not know, but I awaken feeling some force pulling at my sleeve, sitting up startled, and sleep dazed I beheld a young maiden standing in front of me with a dim lighted lantern in hand, she was entirely naked, and most delicately bodious of face and form, pulling at my jacket sleeve was an old woman as ugly as the maiden was beautiful, a cold shiver shook me from head to foot, do you see how good fortune provides my sweet child, the woman was saying as she half pulled the jacket off my shoulders, never despair of fortune, I was tongue tied, and made no effort, to speak still less to resist, in vain I called upon my will, it seemed to have deserted me, so utterly powerless was I in the old woman's hands, although I could blow her, and her child out of the grotto, if I so wished, but I could not even wish, nor did I have the power to blow, not content with the jacket alone the woman proceeded to undress me further until I was entirely naked, as she undressed me, she would hand each garment to the maiden who would put it on herself, the shadow of my naked body thrown against a wall of the grotto together with the two women's tattered shadows filled me with fright and disgust, I watched without understanding, and stood speechless when speech was most urgent, and the only weapon left me in my unsavory state, at last my tongue was loosened and I said, if you have lost all shame old woman I have not, I am ashamed of my nakedness even before a shameless witch like you, but infinitely more ashamed am I before the maiden's innocence, as she wears your shame so wear her innocence, what need has a maiden of a weary man's tattered clothes, and one who is lost in the mountains at such a place in such a night? Perhaps to lighten his load, perhaps to keep her warm, the poor child's teeth are chattering with cold, but when cold makes my teeth, to click wherewith shall I chase it away? Have you no mercy in your heart? My clothes are all my possessions in this world, less possessing, less possessed, more possessing, more possessed, more possessed, less accessed, less possessed, more accessed, let us be off my child, as she took the maiden's hand, and was about to go a thousand questions pressed upon my mind which I wished to ask her, but only one came to the tip of my tongue, before you leave old woman would you not be kind enough to tell me, if I be still far from the summit? You are on the brink of the black pit, the lantern light flickered back to me their queer shadows as they stepped out of the grotto and vanished in the soot black night, a dark chilly wave rushed at me I know not whence, still darker and more chilly waves followed, the very walls of the grotto seemed to be breathing frost. My teeth chattered, and with them my already muddled thoughts, the goats pasturing on flints the mocking goat heard this woman and this maiden, myself naked bruised cut famished freezing dazed I in such a grotto on the edge of such an abyss, was I near my goal? Will I ever reach it? Will there be an end to this night?
Hardly had I the time to collect myself when I heard the barking of a dog and saw another light so near so near, right in the grotto, do you see how good fortune provides my beloved? Never despair of fortune, the voice was that of an old very old man bearded bent and shaky in the knees, he was addressing a woman old as himself toothless disheveled and also bent and shaky in the knees, taking apparently no nod of my presence he continued in the same squeaky voice that seemed to struggle out of his throat, a gorgeous nuptial chamber for our love, and a splendid staff in the place of the one you lost, with such a staff you should not stumble any more my love, saying that he picked up my staff and handed caressingly with her withered hands, then as if taking note of me, but always speaking to his companion he added, this stranger shall depart anon beloved, and we shall dream our night's dreams all alone, this fell upon me as a command which I felt too impotent to disobey, especially when the dog approached me snaring menacingly, as if to carry out his master's order. The whole scene filled me with terror I watched it, as in a trance. And as one entranced I arose and walked to the entrance of the grotto making the wild desperate efforts to speak, to defend myself to assert my right, my staff you have taken, will you be so cruel? as to take this grotto also which is my home for the night. Happy are the staff lest they stumble not, happy are the homeless they are at home. The stumblers only, like ourselves need walk with staff the home chained only like ourselves must have a home. So they chanted together as they prepared their couch digging their long nails in the ground and leveling the gravel as they chanted, but paying no heed to me, this made me cry in desperation. Look at my hands, look at my feet, I am a wayfarer lost in this desolate slope, I traced my way hither in my own blood, not an inch further can I see of this fearful mountain which seems to be so familiar to you? Have you no fear of retribution? Give me at least your lantern, if you will not permit me to share this grotto with you for the night, love will not be haired, light will not be shared, love and see, light and be, when the night is bled, and the day is fled, and the earth is dead, how shall wayfarers fare? Who shall be there to dare? Utterly exasperated I decided to resort to supplication feeling all the while that it would be of no avail, for an uncanny force kept pushing me outside, good old man, good old woman, though numb with cold and dumb with weariness, I shall not be a fly in your ointment, I too have tasted once of love. I shall leave you my staff, and my humble lodging which you have chosen for your nuptial chamber, but one small thing do I ask of you in return. Since you deny me the light of your lantern will you not be so gracious as to guide me out of this grotto and direct me towards the summit? For I have lost all sense of direction and of balance as well, I know not how high I have risen and how much higher I have yet to rise, paying no heed to my supplications they chanted on. The truly high is ever low, the truly swift is ever slow, the highly sensitive is numb, the highly eloquent is dumb, the ebb and flow are but one tide, the guideless has the surest guide, the very great is very small, and he has all who gives his all. As a last effort I besought them to tell me which way I should turn, after leaving the grotto, for death might be lurking for me in the first step I should take, and I did not wish yet to die. Breathlessly I awaited their reply which came in another weird chant, and left me more perplexed and exasperated than before, the brow of the rock is hard and steep, the lap of the void is soft and deep, the lion and the maggot, the cedar and the faggot, the rabbit and the snail, the lizard and the quail, the eagle and the mole all in one hole, one hook, one bait, death alone can compensate, as beneath, so on high, die to live, or live to die. The light of the lantern flickered off as I crawled out of the grotto on hands and knees with the dog crawling behind me, as though to make certain of my exit. Darkness was so heavy I could feel its black weight upon my eyelids, not another moment could I tarry, the dog made me very certain of that, one hesitant step, another hesitant step. At the third I felt as if the mountain had suddenly slipped from under my feet, and I could be caught in the churning billow of a sea of darkness, 
which sucked my breath and tossed me violently down down down. The last vision that flashed through my mind as I whirled in the void of the black pit was that of the fiendish groom and bride. The last words I mumbled as the breath froze in my nostrils were their words, die to live or live to die. Part 3. The Keeper of the Book. Arise O happy stranger, you have attained your goal. Parched with thirst and squirming under the scorching rays of the sun, I half opened my eyes to find me prostrate on the ground and to see the black figure of a man bending over me and gently moistening my lips with water and as gently washing the blood off my many wound. He was heavy of bulk, coarse of features, shaggy of beard and brow deep and sharp of gaze, and of an age most difficult to determine. His touch with Al was soft and strengthening. With his help I was able to sit up and to ask in a voice which barely reached my own ears, where am I? On Altar Peak. And the grotto? Behind you. And the black pit? In front of you. Great was my astonishment indeed when I looked, and in truth, found the grotto behind me, and the black chasm yawning before me. I was on the very brink of it, and I asked the man to move with me into the grotto which he willingly did. Who brought me out of the pit? He who guided you up to the summit must have brought you out of the pit. Who is he? The selfsame he who tied my tongue and kept me chained to this peak for 150 years. Are you then the bound abbot? I am he. But you speak, he is dumb. You have united my tongue. He also shuns the company of men, you do not seem at all afraid of me. I shun all men but you. You never saw my face before, how come you shun all men but me? For 150 years have I awaited your coming? For 150 years omitting not a single day in all seasons, and in all weathers my sinful eyes would search the flints and arrive here as you have arrived staff less naked and provision less, many have attempted the ascent by the slope, but none have re-arrived, many have arrived by other parts, but none staff less naked and provision less, I watched your progress all day yesterday, I let you sleep out the night at the grotto, but with the early dawn I came here, and found you breathless, yet was I certain that you would come to life, and lo, you are more living than I, you have died to live, I am living to die, I glory to his name, it is all as he promised, it is all as it should be, it leaves no question in my mind that you are the chosen man, who, the blessed on into whose hands I should deliver the sacred book, to publish to the world, what book, his book, the book of murdered, murdered, who is murdered? Is it possible you have not heard of murdered? How strange, I was full certain that his name by now had filled the earth as it does fill until this day the ground beneath me the air about me and the sky above me. Holy is his ground O oh stranger his feet trod it, holy is this air his lungs breathed it, holy is this sky. His eyes scanned it, saying that the monk bent reverently kissed the ground three times and felt silent. After a pause I said, you whet my appetite for more about this man you call murdered, lend me your ear, and I will tell you what is not forbidden me to tell, my name is Shamadam. I was senior of the Ark when one of the nine companions died, hardly had his soul departed hence when I was told that a stranger was at the gate asking for me, I knew at once that Providence had sent him to take the dead companion's place and should have rejoiced that God was still watching over the ark as he had done since the days of our father Sam. At this point I interrupted him to ask if what I was told by the people below were true, that the ark was built by Noah's first son. His answer came quick and emphatic, I it is even as you have been told, then continued his interrupted story yea I should have rejoiced, but for reasons entirely beyond my ken I found rebellion heaving in my chest, even before I laid an eye on the stranger my whole being for it against him, and I decided to reject him fully realizing that in rejecting him, I would be violating the inviolable traditions, and rejecting him who sent him, when I opened the gate and saw him, a mere youth of no more than twenty-five, my heart bristled with daggers which I wished to thrust into him, naked apparently famished and devoid of all means of protection even a staff he looked most helpless, 
Yet a certain light upon his face made him appear more invulnerable than a knight in full armor, and much more ancient than his years, my very bowels cried out against him, every drop of blood in my veins wished to crush him, ask me not for an explanation, perhaps this penetrating eye did strip my soul naked, and it frightened me to see my soul unclothed before any man, perhaps his purity unveiled my filth, and it grieved me to lose the veils which I had so long woven for my filth, for filth has ever loved her veils, perhaps there was an ancient feud between his stars and mine who knows? Who knows? He alone can tell. I told him in a voice most blunt and pitiless that he could not be admitted into the community and ordered him to leave the place forthwith, but he stood his ground and quietly counseled me to reconsider. His counsel I took as an insult and I spat upon his face, again he stood his ground unflinchingly and slowly wiping the spittle off his face he once more counseled me to change my decision, as he wiped the spittle off his face I felt as if mine were being smeared with it, I also felt myself defeated, and somewhere in the depth of me admitted that the combat was unequal, and that he was the stronger combatant, like all defeated pride mine would not give up the fight until it saw itself sprawled out and trampled in the dust. I was almost ready to grant the man's request, but I wished to see him humbled first, yet would he not be humbled in any way. Suddenly he asked for some food and clothing, and my hopes revived. With hunger and cold arrayed against him on my side I believed my battle won. Cruelly I refused to give him a morsel of bread saying, that the monastery lived by charity, and could dispense no charity, in that I lied most flagrantly, for the monastery was far too rich to deny food and clothing to the needy, I wanted him to beg, but he would not beg, he demanded as of right, there was commanding in his asking, the battle lasted long but never swayed, from the beginning it was his, to cover my defeat I finally proposed to him to enter the ark as a servant, as a servant only, that I consoled myself would humble him, even then I did not realize that I was the beggar and not he. To seal my humiliation he accepted the proposal without a murmur little did I imagine at the time, that by taking him in, even as a servant, I was putting myself out, until the last day I clung to my delusion, that I and not he was the master of the ark, ah murdered murdered what have you done to Shamadam? Shamadam what have you done to yourself? Two large tears trickled down the man's beard and his great frame shook. My heart was moved and I said, speak no more I pray you of this man whose memory flows out of you in tears, be not disturbed O blessed messenger, it is the senior's pride of the your what is distilling, yet these tears of gall, it is the authority of the letter that is gnashing its teeth against the authority of the spirit, let the pride weep, it weeps its last, let the authority gnash it gnashes for the last time, ah that my eyes were not so veiled in the earthy mist, when they first beheld his celestial countenance, ah that my ears were not so clogged with the wisdom of the world, when they were challenged by his divine wisdom, ah that my tongue were not so coated with the bitter sweets of the flesh, when it battled his spirit coated tongue, but I have reaped much, and am yet to reap more of the tares of my delusion, for seven years he was a lowly servant in our midst, gentle alert and offensive unobtrusive ready to do any companion's slightest bidding, he moved about, as if on air, not a word escaped his lips, we believed him to have taken a vow of silence, unlike the other seven companions who delighted in his calm, and were soothed thereby I found it oppressive and unnerving, many an efforts did I make to disturb it, but all in vain, his name he gave us a murdered, to that name only he responded, that was all we knew of him, yet was he presence keenly felt by all so keenly that seldom we would speak even of things essential save, after he retired into his cell, they were years of plenty the first seven years of murdered, sevenfold and more were the monastery's vast possessions increased. My heart softened towards him, and I seriously consulted the community upon admitting him as a companion seeing that providence sent us no one else, just then occurred what no one did foresee, what no one could foresee, and least of all this poor Shamadam, murdered unsealed his lips and the tempest was unleashed, 
He gave vent to what his silence had so long concealed, and it burst forth in torrents so irresistible that all companions were caught in their sweeping rush, all save this poor Shamadam who fought them to the last. I sought to turn the tide by asserting my authority as senior, but the companions would recognize no authority save that of Murdid. Murdid was the master Shamadam but an outcast, I resorted even to cunning. To some companions I offered rich bribes of silver and of gold, to others I promised large tracts of fertile land. I had almost succeeded when in some mysteries manner Murdid became aware of my labors and undid them without an effort simply with a few words, too strange and too involved was the doctrine he held forth it is all in the book of that I am not allowed to speak. But his eloquence would make the snow appear as pitch, and the pitch as snow, so keen and forceful were his word, to that weapon what could I oppose? Nothing at all except the monastery's seal which was in my keeping, but even that was rendered of no uses, for the companions under his flaming exhortations would force me to set my hand and the monastery's seal to every document they saw fit to have me execute. Bit by bit they deeded away the lands of the monastery which had been donated by the faithful over a stretch of ages, then began murdered to send the companions out laden with gifts to the poor and needy in all the villages hereabout. On the last day of the Ark which was one of the two annual festivals of the Ark, the other being the Day of the Vine, Murdid concluded his mad acts by ordering his companions to strip the monastery clean of all effects and to distribute them to the people gathered without all that I witnessed with my sinful eyes and recorded in my heart that was about to burst with hatred for Murdid. If hate alone could slay that which was then seething in my breast, should have slain a thousand Murdids, but his love was stronger than my hate, again the combat was unequal. Again my pride would not desist until it saw itself sprawled out and trampled in the dust. He crushed me without fighting me. I fought him, but only crushed myself. How often he would try in his long loving patience to remove the scales which were upon my eyes. The more of his gentleness he offered me, the more I gave him of my hatred in return. We were two warriors in the field, murdered and I. He was a legion in himself. I fought a lonely fight. Had I the help of the other companions I should have conquered in the end, and then I would have eaten out his heart, but my companions fought with him against me, the traitors. Murdered murdered you have avenged yourself, more tears accompanied this time by sobs in the long pause, after which the senior once more bent, and three times kissed the ground saying murdered my conqueror my lord my hope my punishment, and my reward forgive Shamadam's bitterness. A snake's head keeps its poison even after it's severed from the body, but happily it cannot bite. Behold Shamadam is now fangless and poisonless, sustain him with your love, that he may see the day, when his mouth shall drip with honey like your mouth, for that he has your promise, you have this day delivered him of his first prison, let him not tarry long in the second, as if he read the question in my mind as to the prisons he had spoken of the senior sighing explained, but in a voice so mellowed and so changed that one could truly swear it was another man's, upon that day he called us all into this very grotto, where often was his wont to teach the seven, the sun was about to set, the west wind had driven up a heavy mist that filled the zorge and hung like a mystic shroud over all the land from here to the sea, it reached no higher than the waist of our mountain which had the appearance of having become seashore, on the western horizon spread grim and heavy clouds that entirely obscured the sun, the master moved, but bridling his emotions embraced each of the seven and turned saying as he embraced the last, long have your lived upon the heights, today must you descend into the depths, save you ascend by descending and save you join the valley to the summit the heights shall ever make you giddy, and the depths shall ever make you blind. Turning then to me, he looked long and tenderly into my eyes and said, As to you Shamadam your hour is not yet, you shall await my coming on this peak, and while awaiting me, you shall be the keeper of my book which is locked within an iron chest beneath the altar, see that no hands touch it, not even yours, in due time I shall send my messenger to take it and to publish it unto the world. By these signs shall you know him, 
he shall have started on his journey hither fully clothed provided with a staff and seven loaves of bread. But you shall find him in front of this grotto staffless provision less and naked, and also devoid of breath, until his coming your tongue and lips shall be sealed, and you shall shun all human company, the sight of him alone shall release you from the prison of silence, after delivering the book into his hands you shall be turned into a stone, which a tone shall guard the entrance to this grotto until my coming, from that prison I alone shall deliver you, should you find the waiting long it shall be made longer, should you find it short it shall be made shorter, believe and be patient, whereupon he embraced me also, then turning again to the seven he waved his hand and said companions follow me, and he marched before them down the slope his noble head uplifted his steady gaze searching the distance his holy feet barely hitting the ground, when they had reached the rim of the pole of the sea forming a vaulted passage in the sky illuminated with a light too wondrous for human words too blinding for mortal eyes, and it looked to me, as if the master with the seven, had been detached from the mountain, and were walking on the mist straight into the vault, into the sun, and it grieved me to be left behind alone ah so alone, like one exhausted by the heavy labors of a long day Shamadam suddenly relaxed, and felt silent his head drooping his eyelids shut his chest heaving in uneven turns, so he remained for a long space, as I searched my mind for some consoling words he raised his head and said, you are beloved of fortune, forgive an unfortunate man, I have spoken much, perhaps too much, how can I otherwise? Can one whose tongue has fasted for 150 years break his fast with, but in yea or nay? Can a Shamadam be a murdered? Allow me a question brother Shamadam, how good of you to call me brother, no one has called me by that name, since my only brother died, and that was many years ago, what is your question? Since Murdad is so great a teacher I am astonished that until this day the world has not heard of him or any of his seven companions, how can Tat be perhaps he is biding his time, perhaps he teaches under some other name, of one thing am I certain. Murdad will change the world as he has changed the ark. He must have died a long time since, not Murdad, Murdad is mightier than death, do you imply he will destroy the world as he destroyed the ark? nay and nay again. He will unburden the world as he unburdened our ark, and then will hear he like the everlasting light which men like me have hid under too many bushels of delusions, and now bemoan the darkness they are in, he will rebuild in men, what men have demolished of themselves. The book shall soon be in your hands, read it and see the light, I must allay no longer, wait here a while till I return you must not come with me. He arose and hastily went out, leaving me quite bewildered and impatient, I too stepped out, but went no further than the edge of the abyss. The magic lines and colors of the scene spread out before my eyes so gripped my soul, that for a moment I felt myself dissolved and sprayed in drops imperceptible over and into everything, over the sea in the distance calm and empled by pearly haze, over the hills now bending now reclining, but all rising in rapid succession from the shore, and steadily pushing upwards to the very crests of the rugged peaks, over the peaceful settlements upon the hills framed in the greenness of the earth, over the verdant valleys nestling in the hills quenching their thirst from the liquid hearts of the mountains, and studded with men at labor and beasts at pasture, into the Georges and ravines the mountains living scars in their battle with time, into the languid breeze, into the azure sky above, into the ashen earth below, only when my eyes in their roaming had come to rest upon the slope was I brought back to the monk and his abashing narrative of himself and of murdered in the book, and I marveled greatly at the hand unseen that set me out in search of one thing, only to lead me to another, and I blessed it in my heart, presently the monk returned, and handing me a small parcel wrapped in a piece of a jailed linen cloth said, my trust is henceforth your trust, be faithful in your trust, now is my second hour at hand the gates of my prison, are swinging open to receive me soon will they swing shut to enclose me, how long will they remain shut murdered only can tell, soon will Shamadam be effaced from every memory, how painful ah how painful it is to be effaced, why say I, 
that nothing is ever effaced from Murdin's memory. Whoever lives in Murdin's memory the same forever lives. A long pause followed after which the senior lifted his head and looking at me with his teardomed eyes resumed in a barely audible whisper, presently you shall descend into the world, but you are nude, and the world abhors nudity, its very soul it traps in rags, my clothes are no longer of use to me, I go into the grotto to shed them, that you may cover your nudity therewith albeit Shamatam's clothes can fit no man except Shamatam, may they not prove entanglements to you. I made no comment on the proposal accepting it in glad silence as the senior went into the grotto, to Dizrub unwrapped the book and fumblingly began to turn its yellow parchment leaves, quickly I found myself arrested by the first page one made an effort to read. I read on and on becoming more and more absorbed, subconsciously I was waiting upon the senior to announce that he has finished undressing and to call me to dress, but minutes passed and he did not call, lifting my eyes from the pages of the book I looked into the grotto and saw in the middle of it the heap of the senior's clothes, but the senior himself was not to be seen, I called him several times each time louder than before, there was no response. I was much alarmed and most bewildered, there was no exit from the grotto, save through the narrow entrance, of that I was certain beyond the slightest doubt, was he an apparition? But I felt his flesh and bone with my own bone and flesh, besides there was the book in my hands, and the clothes inside the grotto, is he perchance beneath them? I went and picked them up piece by piece, and ridiculed myself as I picked them, Many more heaps like them would not cover the bulky senior. Did he in some mysterious manner slip out of the grotto and fall into the black pit? So quickly as the last, though flashed through my mind I dashed outside. As quickly was I pinned to the ground a few steps outside the entrance, when I found me facing a great boulder right on the edge of the pit, the boulder was not there before. It had the appearance of a crouching beast but with a head bearing a striking human likeness of course, and heavy features the chin broad, and uplifted the jaws firmly locked the lips tightly shut the eyes squintingly peering into the vacant north. The book. This is the book of murder as recorded by Naranda. The youngest and the least of his companions a lighthouse, and a heaven for those who yearn to overcome let all others beware of it. Chapter 1. Murdered unveils himself, and speaks on veils and seals. Naranda, upon that eve the eight were gathered round a supper board with Murdered standing to one side and silently awaiting orders. One of the ancient rules for companions was to avoid, so much as possible the use of the word I in their speech, companion Shamatam was boasting of his achievements as senior, he cited many figures showing how much he had added to the wealth and prestige of the Ark, in doing that he made excessive use of the forbidden word, companion Mickey and gently reprimanded him, whereupon a heated discussion arose, as to the purpose of the rule, and who had laid it, down whether father Noah or the first companion meaning Sam, the heat led to recriminations and recriminations to a general confusion, where much was said and nothing understood, wishing to change confusion into mirth Shamatam turned to Murdid and said in evident derision, behold a greater than the patriarch is here, Murdid show us the way out of this maze of words, all eyes were turned upon Murdid, and great were our astonishment and joy, when for the first time in seven years he opened his mouth, and spoke unto us saying, Murdid, companions of the ark. Shamatam's wish though uttered in derision unwittingly foretells Murdid's solemn decision, for since the day he came into the Ark murdered four chose this very time and place, this very circumstance, in which to break his seals and cast away his veils and stand revealed before you and world, with seven seals, has murdered sealed his lips, with seven veils, has murdered veiled his face, that he may teach you in the world, when you are ripe for teaching how to unseal your lips, and to unveil your eyes, and thus reveal yourselves to yourselves in fullness of the glory which is yours, your eyes are veiled with far too many veils, each thing you look upon is but a veil, your lips are sealed with far too many seals, each word you utter forth is but a seal, for things whatever be their form and kind are only veils, and swaddling bands and veils? 
And words, are they not things sealed up in letters and in syllables? How can your lip which itself a seal give utterance to aught but seals? The eye can veil, but cannot pierce the veils, the lip can seal, but cannot break the seals, demand no more of either one of them, that is their portion of the body's labors, and they perform it well. By drawing veils and by setting seals they call aloud to you to come and seek what is behind the veils, and pry out what is beneath the seals. To break the seals you need a lip other than the familiar piece of flesh below your nose. First see the eye itself all right if you would see the other things all right, not with the eye, but through it must you look that you may see all things beyond it. Speak first the lip and tongue all right, if you would speak the other words all right not with the lip and tongue, but through them must you speak, that you may speak all words beyond them, did you but see and speak aright you should see nothing but yourselves, and utter nothing but yourselves, for in all things, and beyond all things, as in all words, and beyond all words are you, the seer and the speaker, if then your world be such a baffling riddle it is because you are that baffling riddle, and if your speech be such a woeful maze it is because you are that woeful maze, let things alone, and labor not to change them, for they seem what they seem, only because you seem what you see, they neither see, nor speak except you lend them sight and speech, if they be harsh of speech look only to your tongue, if they be ugly of appearance search first and last your eye, ask not of things to shed their veils, unveil yourselves and things will be unveiled, nor ask of things to break their seals, unseal yourselves and all will be unsealed, the key to self-unveiling, and self-unsealing is a word which you forever hold between your lips, of words it is the slightest and the greatest, murdered is called it the creative word. Naranda, the master paused, and silence deep, but vibrant with suspense fell upon all, at last Misyun spoke in passionate impatience, Mikayan, our ears are hungry for the word, our hearts are yearning for the key, say on we pray murdered say on. Chapter 2. On the Creative Word. I is the source and center of all things. Murdered, when you say I say forthwith in your heart, God be my refuge from the woes of I, and be my guide unto the bliss of I, for in that word will be it so very slight is locked the soul of every other word. Unlock it once and fragrant is your mouth and sweet the tongue therein. Each word of it shall drip with life's delights, let it remain locked up and foul is the mouth and bitter is the tongue. From every word of it shall ooze the pus of death, for I o monks is the creative word, and save you grasp thereof the magic power, and save you be that power the masters you are too apt to groan when you would sing, or be at war, when you would be at peace, or cringe in goals dark, when you would soar in light, your eye is but your consciousness of being silent, and incorporeal made vocal and corporeal, it is the inaudible in you made audible, and the invisible made visible, that seeing you may see the unseeable, and hearing you may hear the unhearable, for eye and ear bound yet are you, and save you see with eyes, and save you hear with ears you see and hear nothing at all, by merely thinking I you cause a sea of thoughts, to heave within your heads, that sea is the creation of your eye, and which is at once the thinker and the thought, if you have thoughts, that sting or stab or claw know that the eye in you alone endowed them with sting and tusk and claw, murdered would have you know as well, that that which can endow can also disendow, by merely feeling eye you tap a well of feelings in your hearts, that well is the creation of your eye which is at once the feeler and the felt, if there be briars in your hearts, know that the eye in you alone has rooted them therein, murdered would have you know as well, that that which can so readily root in the same can as readily root out, by merely saying I you bring to life a mighty host of words, each word a symbol of a thing, each thing a symbol of a world, each world a part component of an universe, that universe is the creation of your eye which is at once the maker and the made, if there be some hobgoblins in your universe, know that the eye in you alone has brought them into being, murdered would have you know as well, that that which can create can also uncreate, as the creator so is the creation, can anyone overcreate himself? Or anyone undercreate himself? Himself alone, no more no less, does the creator procreate, 
a fountainhead is I whence flow all things, and whither they return. As is the fountainhead, so also is the flow. A magic wand is I yet can the wand give birth, to not save what is the magician. As is the magician so are the products of his wand, as is your consciousness, therefore so is your eye. S is your eye so is your world, if it be clear, and definite of meaning your word is clear, and definite of meaning, and then your words should never be a maze, nor should your deeds be ever nests of pain, if it be hazy and uncertain your word is hazy and uncertain, and then your words are but entanglements, and then your deeds are hatcheries of pain, if it be constant and enduring your word is constant and enduring, then are your mightier than time, and much more spacious than this space, if it be passing, and inconstant your world is passing and inconstant, and then are you a wisp of smoke breathed upon lightly by the sun, if it be one your world is one, and then are you at everlasting peace with all the hosts of heaven, and the tenants of the earth, if it be many your world is many, and then are you at an unending war with your very self, and every creature in God's encompassable domain, I is the center of your life whence radiate the things that make the total of the world and whereunto they converge. If it be steady your world is steady, then no powers above and no powers below can sway you right or left. If it be shifting your world is shifting, and then are you a helpless leaf caught in an angry whirl of wind, and lo! Your world is steady to be sure, but only in unsteadiness, and certain is your world, but only in uncertainty and constant is your world, but only in constancy, and single is your world, but only in unsingleness. Yours is a world of cradles turning into tombs and tombs becoming cradles, of days devouring nights and nights regurgitating days, of peace declaring war and war suing for peace, of smiles afloat on tears and tears aglow with smiles, yours is a world in constant travail with death as the midwife, yours is a world of sieves, and cribbles with no two sieves and cribbles alike, and you are ever at pain sifting the unsiftable and cribbling the uncribbleable, yours is a world set against itself, because the I in you is so divided, yours is a world of barriers and fences, because the I in you is one of barriers and fences, some things it would fence out as alien to itself, some things it would fence in as kindred to itself, yet that outside the fence is ever breaking in, and that within the fence, is ever breaking out, for they being offspring of the same mother, even your eye, would not be set apart, and you rather than joy in their happy union, bedgered yourselves anew for the fruitless labor of separating the inseparable, rather than bind the cleavage in the eye, you whittle away your life hoping to make thereof a wedge, to drive between what you believe to be your eye, and what you imagine other than your eye. Therefore are men's words dipped in poison, Therefore are their days so drunken with sorrow? Therefore are their nights so tortured with pain, murdered? O monk would bind the cleavage in your eye, that you may live at peace with yourselves, with all men, with the universe entire, murdered would draw the poison from your eye, that you may taste the sweetness of understanding, murdered would teach you how to weigh you, I so as to know the joy of perfect balance. Naranda, again the master paused and again deep silence fell on all, once more Mikayan broke the silence saying Mikayan, too tantalizing are the words murdered, they open many doors but leave us on the threshold, let us beyond, lead us within. Chapter 3. The Holy Triune and the Perfect Balance. Murdered, though each of you be centered in his eye yet are you all encentered in one eye, even the single eye of God. God's eye, O oh monks, is God's eternal only word, in it is God, the consciousness supreme, made manifest, without it he would be a silence absolute, by it is the creator self-created, by it is the formless one made to take on a multiplicity of forms through which the creatures shall pass again to formlessness, to feel himself, to think himself, to speak himself God need not utter more than I therefore is I his only word, therefore is it the word. When God says I nothing is left unsaid, worlds seen and worlds unseen, things born and things awaiting birth, time rolling by and time is yet to roll, all all excepting not a grain of sand are uttered forth, and pressed into that word, 
by it were all things made, through it are all sustained, except it have a meaning a word is but an echo in the void, except its meaning be forever one it is but cancer in the throat and pimples on the tongue, God's word is not an echo in the void, nor a cancer in the throat nor pimples on the tongue, except for those devoid of understanding, for understanding is the spirit holy, that vivifies the word, and binds it unto consciousness, it is the writer beam of the balance eternal whose two pans are the primal consciousness and the word. The primal consciousness, the word, the spirit of understand, behold, O monks the trinity of being, the three which are one, the one which is three, co-equal, co-extensive, co-eternal, self-balancing, self-knowing, self-fulfilling, never increasing nor decreasing, ever at peace, ever the same, that is O monks the perfect balance. Man names it God, although it is too wondrous to be named, yet holy is this name and holy is the tongue, that keeps it holy, now what is man, if not an offspring of this God? Can he be different from God? Is not the oak ends with within the acorn? Is not God wrapped in man? Man too therefore is such a holy triumph. A consciousness of word and understanding man too is the creator like his God, his eye is his creation, why is he not so balanced as his God? If you would know the answer to this riddle here well what murdered shall reveal. Chapter 4. Man is a God in swaddling bands. Man is a god in swaddling bands, time is a swaddling band, space is a swaddling band, flesh is a swaddling band and likewise all the senses and the things perceivable therewith. The mother knows too well that the swaddling bands are not the babe, the babe however knows it not, man is too conscious yet of his swaddles which change from day to day and from age to age, hence is his consciousness ever in flux and hence his word which is his consciousness expressed, is never clear, and definite of meaning, and hence his understanding is in fog, and hence is his life out of balance, it is confusion thrice confounded, and so man pleads for help, his agonizing cries reverberate throughout the eons, the air is heavy with his moans, the sea is salty with his tears, the earth is furrowed with his tombs, the heavens are deafened with his prayers, and all because he knows not yet the meaning of his eye which is to him the swaddling bands as well as the babe therein and swaddled, in saying I man cleaves the word in twain. His swaddling bands the one, God's deathless self the other, does man in truth divide the indivisible? God forbid, the indivisible no power can divide not even God's, man's immaturity imagines the division and man the infant girds himself for battle, and wages war upon the infinite all self believing it to be the enemy of his being, in this unequal fight man, tears his flesh and shreds and spills his blood and streams, while God the father mother lovingly looks on, for he knows well that man is tearing, but the heavy veils and spilling, but the bitter gall that blind him to his oneness with the one, that is man's destiny, to fight and bleed, and faint and in the end to wake, and bind the cleavage in the eye with his own flesh, and seal it with his blood, therefore O monks have you been cautioned, and very wisely cautioned, to be chary in the use of eye. For so long as you mean thereby the swaddling bands, and not the babe alone, so long as it is for you a cribble, rather than a crucible, just so long will you be cribbling vanity only to gather death with all his brood of agonies and pains. Chapter 5. On Crucibles and Cribbles God's Word and Man's. A crucible is the word of God, what it creates it melts and fuses into one accepting none as worthy rejecting none as worthless, having the spirit of understand it knows fully well that its creations and itself are one, that to reject a part is to reject the whole, and to reject the whole is to reject itself, therefore is it forever one of purpose and purport, whereas a cribble is man's word, what it creates it sets it grips and blows, it is forever picking this as friend, and casting that away as enemy, and but too oft its friend of yesterday becomes the enemy of today, the enemy of today the friend of tomorrow, thus rages on the cruel and the fruitless war of man against himself, and all because man lacks the Holy Spirit which alone can make him understand that he and his creation are but one. 
that to cast out the foe is to cast out the friend, for both words foe and friend are the creation of his word, his eye what you dislike, and cast away as evil is surely liked, and picked up by someone or something else as good, can one thing be at once two self-excluding things? Neither is it the one or the other excepting your eye has made it evil, another eye has made it good, did I not say that that which can create can also uncreate? As you create an enemy so can you uncreate him, or recreate him as a friend, for that your eye must needs be a crucible, for that you need the spirit of understanding, therefore I say to you that, if you pray for anything at all, pray first and last for understanding, never be cribblers my companions, for the word of God is life and life is a crucible wherein all is made in oneness indivisible, all is a perfect equilibrium and all is worthy of its author, the Holy Trinity, how much more worthy must it be if you never be cribblers my companions and you shall stand in stature so immense so alpervating and so all-embracing that no cribbles can be found to contain you, never be cribblers my companions, seek first the knowledge of the word, that you may know your own word, and when you know your word you shall consign your cribbles to the fire, for your word and God's are one, except that yours is still in veils, Murdered would have you cast away the veils, God's word is time untimed and space unspaced, was there a time when you were not with God? Is there a place where you are not in God? Why chain you then eternity with hours and with seasons? And why corral the space in inches and in miles? God's word is life unborn therefore undying, wherefore is yours beset with birth and death? Are you not living by God's life alone? And can the deathless be the source of death? God's word is all-inclusive, nor barriers nor fences are therein. Wherefore is yours so rent with fence and barriers? I say to you your very flesh at bone are not the bone and flesh of you alone, innumerable are the hands that dip with you in the same flesh pots of earth and sky, whence come your bone and flesh, and whither they return, nor is the light in your eyes the light of you alone, it is as well the light of all that share the sun with you. What could your eye behold of me were it, not for the light in me? It is my light that sees me in your eye, it is your light that sees you in my eye. Were I a total darkness your eye looking at me would be a total darkness, nor is the breath within your breast a breath of you alone, all those that breathe, or even breathe the air are breathing in your breast, is it not Adam's breath? that still inflates your lungs is it not Adam's heart that is still beating in your hearts? Nor are your thoughts the thoughts of you alone, the sea of common thought does claim them as her own, and so do all the thinking beings who share that sea with you, nor are your dreams of you alone, the universe entire is dreaming in your dreams, nor is your house the house of you alone, it is as well the dwelling of your guest, and of the fly the mouse the cat and all the creatures, that share the house with you, beware therefore of fences, you but fence in deception and fence out the truth, and when you turn about to see yourselves within the fence you find you face to face with death which is deception by another name, inseparable O monks is man from God, therefore inseparable from his fellow men and all the creatures, that issue from the word, the word is the ocean, you the clouds, and is a cloud a cloud save for the ocean it contains? Yet foolish indeed is the cloud that would waste away its life striving to pin itself in space so as to keep its shape and its identity forever. What would a treat of its so foolish striving but disappointed hopes and bitter vanity? Except it lose itself it cannot find itself, except it die and vanish as a cloud it cannot find the ocean in itself which is its only self, a God-bearing cloud is man. Save he be emptied of himself he cannot find himself, ah the joy of being empty. Save you be lost forever in the word you cannot understand the word which is you, even your eye, ah the joy of being lost. Again I say to you pray for understanding, when holy understanding finds your hearts there shall be naught in God's immensity, that shall not ring to you a glad response each time you utter I and then shall death himself be but a weapon in your hands wherewith to vanquish death, and then shall life bestow upon your hearts the key into her boundless heart that is the golden key of love. Shamadam, 
I never dreamed that so much wisdom could be wrung out of a dish rag and a broom, alluding to Murdid's position as a servant. Murdid, all is a store of wisdom for the wise, to the unwise wisdom herself is folly, Shamadam. You have a clever tongue no doubt, a wonder you have bridled it so long, your words albeit are much too hard to hear, Murdid. My words are easy Shamadam it is your ear that's hard, but woe to them who hearing do not hear, and woe to them who seeing do not see, Shamadam. I hear and see too well, perhaps too much, yet would I not hear such a folly, that Shamadam is the same as Murdid, that the master and the servant are alike. Chapter 6. On Master and Servant Companions Give Opinions of Murdid. Murdid, Murdid is not Shamadam's only servant, can you Shamadam count your servants? Is there an eagle or a falcon? Is there a cedar or an oak? Is there a mountain or a star? Is there an ocean or a lake? Is there an angel or a king that do not serve Shamadam? Is not the whole world in Shamadam's service? Nor is murdered Shamadam's only master. Can you Shamadam count your masters? Is there a beetle or a flea? Are there an owl or a sparrow? Is there a thistle or twig? Is there a pebble or shell? Is there a dewdrop or a pond? Is there a beggar or a thief that are not served by Shamadam? Is not Shamadam in the whole world service? For in doing its work the world does yours also, and in doing your work you do the world's work too. I the head is the master of the belly, but no less is the belly master of the head, nothing can serve save it be served by serving, and nothing can be served except it serves the serving, I say to you Shamadam and to all the servant is the master's master, the master is the servant's servant, let not the servant bow his head, let not the master raise it high, crush out the deadly master's pride, root out the shameful servant's shame, remember that the word is one, and you as syllables in the word, are in reality but one, no syllable is nobler than the other, nor more essential than the other, the many syllables are but a single syllable, even the word, such monosyllables must you become, if you would know the passing ecstasy of that unutterable self-love which is a love for all, for everything, not as a master to his servant, nor as a servant to his master, do I now speak to you Shamadam, but as a brother to a brother, wherefore are you so troubled by my words? Deny me if you will, I will deny you not, did I not say a while, since that the flesh upon my back was no other than that upon your back? I would not stab you lest I bleed, so sheathe your tongue, if you would spare your blood, unlock your heart to me, if you would have it locked against all pain, better by far to be without a tongue than to have one whose words are snares and briars, and words shall always wound, and snare until the tongue be cleansed by holy understanding, I bid you search your hearts O monks, I bid you tear all barriers therein. I bid you cast away the swaddling bands wherewith your eye is self and swaddled, that you may see it as one with the word of God eternally at peace with itself and all the worlds, that issue out of it, so taught I Noah, so I teach you, Naranda, thereupon murdered withdrew into his cell leaving us all exceedingly abashed, after a space of almost crushing silence companions started to disperse each giving as he left his estimate of murdered. Shamadam, a beggar dreaming of a kingly crown, Mikaian, he is the stowaway, did he not say so taught I know a? A bimer, a spool of tangled thread, Mikaster, a star of another firmament, Benun, he is a mighty mind, but lost in contradictions, Zamora, a wondrous harp strung in no key we know, Himmel, a vagrant word seeking a friendly ear. Chapter 7. Mikayan and Naranda hold a nocturnal chat with Murdid who hints to them of the coming flood and bids them to be ready. Naranda, it was about the second hour of the third watch when I felt my cell door open and heard Mikayan speaking to me at low breath, are you awake Naranda? Sleep has not visited my cell this night Mikayan. Nor has it nested in my eyelids and he, think you he sleeps? Mean you the master? Call you him master already? Mayhap he is, I cannot rest till I make sure of his identity. Let us to him this very minute. We tiptoed out of my cell and into that of the master, 
a sheaf of paling moonlight stealing through an aperture high up in the wall, fell on his humble bedding which was neatly spread on the floor, and quite evidently untouched that night, he whom we sought, was not to be found where we sought him. Puzzled ashamed and disappointed we were about to retrace our steps, when of a sudden his gentle voice reached our ears before our eyes could glimpse his gracious countenance at the door, murdered, be not be perturbed and sit you down in peace, night on the peaks, is fast dissolving into dawn, the hour is propitious for dissolving, Mickeyan, perplexed and stammering, forgive our intrusion, we have not slept all night, murdered, too brief a self-forgetfulness is sleep, better it is to drown the self-awake than sip forgetfulness by thimblefuls of sleep, what seek you of murdered, Mickeyan, we came to find out who are you, murdered, when with men I am a god, when with god I am a man, have you found out Mickeyan? Mickeyan, you speak of blasphemy, murdered, against Mickeyan's god, perhaps, against the god of murdered, never, Mickeyan, are there as many gods as men, that you should speak of one for Mickeyan and another for murdered? Murdered, god is not many, god is one, but many and divers are yet men's shadows, so long as men cast shadows on the earth so long as each man's god no greater than his shadow, the shadow less only are all in the light, the shadow less only know one god, for god is light and light alone is able to know light, Mickeyan, speak not to us in riddles, too feeble yet is our understanding, murdered, all is a riddle to the man who trails a shadow, for that man walks in borrowed light therefore he stumbles on his shadow, when you become ablaze with understanding then shall you cast no shadows any more, yet before long murdered shall gather up your shadows and burn them in the sun, then that which is a riddle to you now shall burst upon you as a blazing truth too evident to need expounding, Mickeyan, would you not tell us who you are? Perhaps if we know your name, your real name, your country and your ancestry we would the better understand you, murdered, ah Mickeyan, as well force an eagle back into the shell out of which he hatched as try to chain murdered with your chains and veil him in your veils. What name can ever designate a man who is no longer in the shell? What country can contain a man in whom an universe is contained? What ancestry can claim a man whose only ancestor is God? If you could know me well Mickeyan first know Mickeyan well, Mickeyan, perhaps you are a myth wearing the garb of man, murdered, I people shall say some day murdered was but a myth, but you shall know anon, how real is this myth, how more real than any kind of men's reality, the world is now unmindful of murdered, murdered is ever mindful of the world, the world shall soon be mindful of murdered, Mickeyan, are you perchance the stowaway, murdered, I am the stowaway in every arc breasting the deluge of delusion, I take the helm, whenever captains call on me for help, your hearts although you know it not have called aloud to me since long ago, and lo, murdered is here to steer you safely on, that you in turn, may steer the world out of the greatest deluge ever known, Mickeyan, another flood, murdered, not to wash out the earth, but to bring out the heaven and the earth, not to efface the trace of man, but to uncover God and man, Mickeyan, the rainbow graded our skies, but a few days agone, how speak you of another flood? Murdered, more devastating than the flood of Noah shall be the flood already raging on, an earth engulfed in water is an earth pregnant with promises of spring, not so an earth as stew in her own feverish blood, Mickeyan, are we to look then for the end? For we are told, that the coming of the stowaway, shall be the signal of the end, Murdered, have no fear for the earth, too young is she and too overflowing are her breasts, more generations shall she suckle yet than you can count, nor have anxiety for man the master of the earth for he is indestructible, yea ineffaceable is man, yea inexhaustible is man, he shall go into the forge a man, but shall emerge a god, be steady make ready, keep your eyes and ears and tongues on fast, so that your hearts may know that holy hunger which once appeased leaves you forever full, you must be ever full, that you may fill the wanting, you must be ever strong, that you may prop the wavering and the weak, you must be ever ready for the storm, that you may shelter all the storm-tossed waves, you must be ever luminous, 
that you may guide the walkers in the dark. The weak are burdens to the weak, but to the strong they are a pleasant change. Seek out the weak, their weakness is your strength. The hungry are but hunger to the hungry, but to the full they are a welcome outlet. Seek out the hungry, your fullness is their want. The blind are stumbling blocks to the blind, but they are millipists to the seeing. Seek out the blind, their darkness is your light. Naranda, at that point the trumpet sounded forth the call to morning prayer, murdered. Zamora trumpets in another day, another miracle for you to yawn away between down sitting and uprising charging your stomachs and discharging them wetting your tongues with idle words and doing many deeds which were better undone and not doing the deeds which need be done. Mikayan, shall we not go to prayer then? Murdered, go. Pray as you have been taught to pray, pray anyway, for anything, go. Do all things commanded you to do till you become self-taught and self-commanded, and till you learn to make each word a prayer each deed a sacrifice, go in peace, murdered must see, that your morning meal be plentiful and sweet. Chapter 8. The seven seek murdered in the airy, where he warns them of doing things in the dark. Naranda, that day Mikayan and I went not to morning devotions, Shamadam noted our absence, and having learned of our night visit to the master was sore displeased, yet he vented not his displeasure biting another time. The rest of the companions were much aroused by our behavior and wished to know thereof the reason, some thought it was the master who counseled us against praying, others made curious conjectures as to his identity saying that he had called us unto him at night in order to reveal himself to us alone. None would believe he was the stowaway, but all desired to see him and to question him on many things. It was the master is wont, when free from duties in the ark, to spend his hours in the grotto overhanging the black pit which grotto was known among us as the airy. We sought him there all of us save Shamit in the afternoon of that day and found him deep in meditation. His face was aglow, and it glowed brighter, when he lifted up his eyes and saw us, murdered, how quickly have you found your nest, murdered is joyful for your sakes, a bimer, the ark is our nest, how say you this grotto is our nest, murdered, the ark was once an airy, a bimer, and today, murdered, a mole burrow alas, a bimer, eight happy moles with murdered as the ninth, murdered, how easy it is to mock, how hard to understand. Yet mockery has ever mocked the mocker, why exercise your tongue in vain? A bimer. It is you that mock us when you call us moles. Wherein have we deserved of such an appellation? Have we not kept the fire of Noah burning? This ark once a hovel for a handful of beggars have we not made it richer than the richest palace? Have we not thrust its borders far till it became a mighty kingdom? If we be moles then are we master burrowers indeed, murdered, the fire of Noah burn, but only on the altar, of what avail is it to you except you be the altar, and your hearts the fire wood and the oil. The ark is overcharged with gold and silver now, therefore it squeaks and pitches hard, and is about to founder, whereas the mother ark was overcharged with life, and carried no dead weight, therefore the deeps were powerless against it. Beware of dead weight my companions, all is dead weight to the man who has a firm faith in his godhood, he holds in himself the world yet carries not its weight, I say to you except you jettison your silver, and your gold they'll drag you with them to the bottom, for man is held by everything he holds, release your grip on things, if you would not be in their grip, set not on anything a price for the slightest thing is priceless, you price a loaf of bread, why not price the sun, the air, the earth, the sea, and the sweat and ingenuity of man without which there could have been no loaf? Set not on anything a price lest you be setting prices on your lives. No dearer is man's life than that which he holds dear. Take care that you hold not your priceless life so cheap as gold, the borders of the ark you thrust for leagues away. Were you to thrust them to the borders of the earth you would still be hemmed in the confined, Murdered would have you belt and cap infinity, the sea is but an earth held drop yet does it belt and cap the earth, how much more infinite a sea is man. Be not so childish as to measure him from head to foot and think 
that you have found his borders, you may be master burrowers as a bimer has said, but only as the mole that labors in the dark. The more elaborate his labyrinth the further from the sun his face, I know your labyrinths a bimer, you are a handful as you say supposedly divorced from all the world's temptations and consecrated unto God, yet devious and dark are the paths that link you with the world, do I not hear your passions hiss and toss? Do I not see your envies crawl and writhe upon the very altar of your God? A handful you may be, but oh what legions in that handful! Were you in very deed the master burrowers you say you are you should have long since burrowed your way, not only through the earth, but through the sun as well, and every other sphere whirl in the firmament, let moles burrow their dark pathways with snout and paw, you need not move an eyelash to find your royal road, sit in this nest, and send imagination forth, he is your guide divine unto the wondrous treasures of the trackless being which is your kingdom, follow your guide with stout and fearless hearts, his footprints be they in the farthest star shall be to you as signs and sureties, that you have already been planted there, for you cannot imagine aught save it be in you, or a part of you, a tree can spread no further than its roots, while man can spread unto infinity for he is rooted in eternity, set no limits to yourselves, spread out until there are no regions where you are not, spread out until the whole world be wherever you may chance to be, spread out till you meet God wherever you meet yourselves, spread out, spread out, do nothing in the dark in the belief that darkness is a cover impenetrable. If you be unashamed of darkness blinded man have shame at least of the firefly and the bat, there is no darkness my companions, there are degrees of light so graduated as to meet the need of every creature in the world, your broad day is twilight to the phoenix, your deep night is broad day to the frog, if darkness itself be uncovered how can it be for anything a cover? Seek not to cover anything at all, if not reveal your secrets their very cover will, does not the lid know what is in the pot? Woe to the snake and worm filled pots, when their lids are lifted, I say to you no breath escapes your breasts except it broadcast on wind the innermost of your breasts, no glance is shot from any eye except it carry with it all the eye its lusts, and fears its smiles and tears, no dream has ever entered any door except it knocked at every other door, take care then how you look, take care what dreams you let in the door, and what you let go by, if you however would be free of care and pain, murdered would fain point out the way. Chapter 9. The way to painless life, companions would know, if murdered be the stowaway. Mickister, show us the way, murdered, this is the way to freedom from care and pain, so think as if your every thought were to be etched in fire upon the sky for all, and everything to see for so in truth it is, so speak as if the world entire were but a single ear intent on hearing what you say, and so in truth it is, so do as if your every deed were to recoil upon your heads, and so in truth it does, so wish as if you were the wish, and so in truth you are, so live as if your God himself had need of you his life to live, and so in truth he does, Himmel, declare yourself that we may know what ear to hear you with, if you be the stowaway give us some proof, the noon, the stowaway should come to judge the world and we of the ark, should sit with him in judgment, shall we make ready for the judgment day? Chapter 10. On Judgment and the Judgment Day. Murdered, there is no judgment in my mouth but holy understanding, I am not come to judge the world, but rather to unjudge it, for ignorance alone likes, to be decked in wig and robe, and to propound the law and mete out penalties, the most unsparing judge of ignorance is ignorance itself, consider man, has he not in ignorance, cloven himself and twain thereby inviting death upon himself and all the things that make up his divided world? I say to you there is not God and man, but there is God man or man God, there is the one, however multiplied however divided it is forever one, God's oneness is God's everlasting law, it is a self-enforcing law, nor courts nor judges does it need to publish it abroad, or to uphold its dignity and force, the universe, the visible of it and the invisible, is but a single mouth proclaiming it to all who have but ears to hear, 
Is not the sea though vast and deep, a single drop? Is not the earth, though flung so far, a single sphere? Are not the sphere, though numberless, a single universe? Likewise is mankind, but a single man, likewise is man with all his worlds a singleness complete. God's oneness my companions is the only law of being, another name for it is love, to know it and abide by it is to abide in life, but to abide by any other law is to abide in non-being or death, life is gathering in, death is a scattering out, life is a binding together, death is a falling away, therefore is man, the dualist, suspended twixt the two, for he would gather in, but only through scattering out, and he would bind, but only by unbinding, in gathering and binding he is in keeping with the law, and life is his reward, in scattering and unbinding he sins against the law, and death is his bitter prize, yet you the self-condemned would sit in judgment over men who are like you already self-condemned, how horrible the judge is in the judgment. Less horrible indeed would be two gallows birds each sentencing the other to the gallows, less laughable two oxen in one yoke each saying to the other I would yoke you, less hideous two corpses in one grave exchanging condemnations to the grave, less pitiful two stone blind men each plucking out the other's eyes, shun every judgment seat my companions, for to pronounce a judgment on anyone or anything you must not only know the law and live comfortably there too, but hear the evidence as well, whom shall you hear as witness in any case at hand? Shall you summon the wind into the court? For the wind aids and abets in any happening beneath the sky, or shall you sight the stars? For they are privy to all things that take place in the world? Or shall you send subpoena to the dead from Adam till this day? For all the dead are living in the living, to have an evidence complete in any given case the cosmos must needs be the witness. When you can hail the cosmos into court you would require no courts, you would descend from judgment seat, and let the witness be the judge, when you know all you would judge none, when you can gather in the world you would condemn, not even one of those who scatter out, for you would know that scattering condemned the scatterer, and rather than condemn the self-condemned you would then strive to lift his condemnation, too overburdened now is man with burden self-imposed, too rough and crooked is his road, each judgment is an added burden alike to the judge and the judged. If you would have your burdens light refrain from judging any man, if you would have them vanish of themselves sink, and be lost forever in the word, let understanding guide your steps, if you would have your pathway straight and smooth, not judgment do I bring you in my mouth but holy understanding, the noon, what of the judgment day? Murdered, each day Benun is judgment day, each creature's accounts are balanced every twinkling of an eye, nothing is hid, nothing is left unweighed, there is no thought no deed no wish, but are recorded in the thinker, and the doer and the wisher, no though no wish no deed go sterile in the world, but all beget after their kind and nature, whatever is in keeping with God's law is gathered unto life, whatever is opposed, is gathered unto death. Your days are not alike benoon, some are serene, they are the harvestings of ours rightly lived, some are beset with clouds, they are the gifts of ours half asleep in death and half awake in life, while others dash on you astride a storm with lightning in their eyes and thunder in their nostrils, they smite you from above they whip you from below, they toss you right and left, they flatten you onto the earth, and make you bite the dust, and wish you were never born, such days are the fruit of hours spent in willful opposition to the law, so is it with the world, the shadows already athwart the skies are not a whit less ominous than those which ushered in the flood, open your eyes and see. When you observe the clouds riding the south wind northward you say they bring your rain, why are you not as wise in measuring the drift of human clouds? Can you not see how fast have men become entangled in their nets? The day of disentanglement is at hand, and what a fearful day it is. With heart and soul veins have the nets of men been woven over the course of lo so many centuries. To tear men free of their nets their very flesh must needs be torn, their very bone must needs be crushed, and men themselves shall do the tearing and the crushing. When the lids are lifted, as surely they shall be, and when the pots give out whatever they contain, 
as surely they shall do, where would men hide their shame, and whither would they flee? In that day the living shall have envy of the dead, and the dead shall curse the living, men's words shall stick within their throats, and the light shall freeze upon their eyelids, out of their hearts shall issue scorpions and vipers, and they shall cry in awe, whence come these vipers and these scorpions forgetting, that they lodged and reared them in their hearts, open your eyes and see, right in this ark set as a beacon to a floundering world there is more than you can muddle through, if the beacon have become a snare, how terrible must be the state of those at sea. Murdered will build you a new ark, right in this nest shall he found it and rear it, out of this nest shall you fly unto the world bearing not olive twigs to men but life inexhaustible, for that you must know the law and keep it, Zamora, how shall we know God's law and keep it? Chapter 11. Love is the law of God murdered divine's estrangement between two companions, calls for harp, and sings hymn of the new ark. Murdered, love is the law of God, you live that you may learn to love, you love that you may learn to live, no other lesson is required of man, and what is it to love, but for the lover, to absorb forever the beloved, so that the twain be one. And whom or what is one to love? Is one to choose a certain leaf upon the tree of life, and pour upon it all one's heart? What of the branch, that bears the leaf? What of the stem, that holds the branch? What of the bark, that shields the stem? What of the roots, that feed the bark the stem the branches and the leaves? What of the soil embosoming the roots? What of the sun and sea and air that fertilize the soil? You say but there be leaves, and leaves upon a single tree, some are healthy some are sick, some are beautiful some ugly, some are giants some are dwarfs, how can we help, but pick and choose? I say to you out of the paleness of the sick proceeds the freshness of the healthy, I further say to you that ugliness is beauty's palette paint and brush, and that the dwarf would not have been a dwarf had he not given of his stature to the giant, you are the tree of life, beware of fractioning yourselves, set not a fruit against a fruit a leaf against a leaf a bough against a bough, nor set the stem against the roots, nor set the tree against the mother soil, that is precisely what you do, when you love one part more than the rest, or to the exclusion of the rest, you are the tree of life, your roots are everywhere, your boughs and leaves are everywhere, your fruits are in every mouth, whatever be the fruits upon that tree, whatever be its boughs and leaves, whatever be its roots they are your fruits, they are your leaves and boughs, they are your roots, if you would have the tree bear sweet and fragrant fruit, if you would have it ever strong and green seed of the sap wherewith you feed the roots, love is the sap of life, while hatred is the pus of death, but love like blood must circulate unhindered in the veins, repress the blood, and it becomes a menace and a plague, and what is hate? But love repressed or love withheld therefore becoming such a deadly poison both to the feeder and the fed, both to the hater and to that he hates. A yellow leaf upon your tree of life is but a love-weaned leaf, blame not the yellow leaf, a withered bough is but a love-starved bough, blame not the withered bough, a putrid fruit is but a hatred-suckled fruit, blame not the putrid fruit but rather blame your blind and stingy heart that would dole out the sap of life to few, and would deny it to many thereby denying it to itself, no love is possible except the love of self, no self is real save the all-embracing self, therefore is God all love, because he loves himself, so long as you are pained by love you have not found your real self, nor have you found the golden key of love, because you love an ephemeral self you love is ephemeral, the love of man for woman is not love, it is thereof a very distant token. The love of parent for the child is but the threshold to love's holy temple, till every man be every woman's lover in the reverse, till every child be every parent's child, and the reverse let men and women brag of flesh and bone clinging to flesh and bone, but never speak the sacred name of love, for that is blasphemy. You have no friend so long you can count a single man as foe, the heart that harbors enmity, how can it be a safe abode for friendship? You do not know the joy of love, so long as there is hatred in your hearts, 
Were you to feed all things the sap of life except a certain tiny worm, that certain tiny worm alone would embitter your life, for in loving anything or anyone you love in truth but yourselves, likewise in hating anything or anyone you hate in truth but yourselves, for that which you hate is bound up inseparably with that which you love like the face, and the reverse of the same coin, if you would be honest with yourselves then must you love what you hate, and what hates you before you love what you love, and what loves you, love is not a virtue, love is a necessity, more so than bread and water, more so than light and air, let no one pride himself on loving, but rather breathe in love, and breathe it out just as unconsciously and freely as you breathe in the air, and breathe it out, for love needs no one to exalt it, love will exalt the heart, that it finds worth of itself, love neither lends nor borrows, love neither buys nor sells, but when it gives it gives it s all, and when it takes it takes its all, its very taking is a giving, its very giving is a taking, therefore is it the same today tomorrow and forevermore, just as a mighty river emptying itself in the sea, is air replenished by the sea so must you empty yourselves in love, that you may be ever filled with love, the pool that would withhold the sea gift from the sea, becomes a stagnant pool, there is nor more nor less in love, the moment you attempt to grade, and measure love it slips away leaving behind it bitter memories, nor is there now, and then nor here and there in love, all seasons are love seasons, all spots are fit abodes for love, love knows no boundaries or bars, a love whose course is checked by any obstacle whatever is not yet worthy of the name of love, I often hear you say, that love is blind meaning, that it can see no fault in the beloved, that kind of blindness is the height of seeing, would you were always so blind, as to behold no fault in anything, nay clear and penetrating is the eye of love, therefore it sees no fault, when love has purged your sight then would you see nothing at all unworthy of your love, only a love's horn faulty eye is ever busy finding faults, whatever fault it finds are only its own faults, love integrates, hatred disintegrates, this huge and ponderous mass of earth and rock which you call altar peak would quickly fly asunder were it not held together by the hand of love, even your bodies perishable as they seem, could certainly resist disintegration did you, but love each cell of them with equal zeal, Love is peace athrob with melodies of life, hatred is war agog with fiendish blasts of death. Which would you, love and be at everlasting peace? Or hate and be at everlasting war? The whole earth is alive in you, the heavens and their hosts are alive in you, so love the earth and all her suckling. If you would love yourselves, and love the heavens and all their tenants, if you would love yourselves, why do you hate Naranda Abimur Naranda? All were taken aback by so sudden a shift in the master's voice and course of thoughts. While Abimer and I were dumbstruck by so pointed a question about an estrangement between us which we carefully hid from all, and had reasons to believe it was not detached by any, all looked upon the two of us in utter wonder, and waited on the lips of Abimer. Abimer, aying me in reproach, did you Naranda tell the master? Naranda, when Abimer has said the master my heart melted in joy within me, for it was round, that word that we had disagreed long before murdered revealed himself, I holding that he was a teacher come to enlighten men, and Abimer insisting he was but a common man, murdered, look not askance upon Naranda Abimer, for he is blameless of your blame, Abimer, who told you then, can you read men's minds too? Murdered, murdered needs nor spies nor interpreters, did you but love murdered as he loves you, you could with ease read in his mind, and see into his heart as well, Abimer, forgive a blind and a deaf man master, open my eye and ear for I am eager to see and to hear, murdered, love is the only wonder worker, if you would see let love be in the pupil of the eye, if you would hear let love be in the drum of the ear, Abimer, but I hate no man not even Naranda, murdered, not hating is not loving a bimer, for love is an active force, and save it guide your every move, and step you cannot find you way, and save it fill your every wish, and thought your wishes shall be nettles in your dreams, your thoughts shall be as dirges for your days, now is my heart a harp, and I am moved to song, 
Where is your harp good Zamora? Zamora, shall I go and fetch it master? Murdered, go Zamora, Miranda. Zamora instantly arose and went for the harp. The rest looked at each other in utter bewilderment and held their peace when Zamora returned with the harp and master gently took it from his hand and bending over it in tenderness carefully adjusted every string and then began to play and sing. Murdered, God is your captain sail my ark. Though hell unleash her furies red upon the living and the dead and turn the earth to molten lead and sweep the skies of every mark. God is your captain sail my ark, love is your compass ply my ark, go north and south go east and west, and share with all your treasure chest. The storm shall bear you on its crest, a light for sailors in the dark, love is your compass ply my ark, faith is your anchor ride my ark, should thunder roar and lightning dart, and mountains shake and fall apart, and man become so faint of heart, as to forget the holy spark. Faith is your anchor ride my ark. Naranda, the master ceased and bent over the harp as bends a mother, love entranced over an infant at her breast. And though its strings no longer quivered, the harp continued to ring on. God is your captain, sail my ark. And though the master's lips were shut his voice reverberated for a space thought out the airy and floated out in waves unto the rugged peaks about, unto the hills and vales below unto the restless sea in the distance, unto the vaulted blue overhead. There were star showers and rainbows in that voice. There were quakes and gales along with soughing winds and song intoxicated nightingales. There were heaving seas empled with soft, dew-laden mist, and it seemed as if the whole of creation were listening thereto in thankful gladness. And it further seemed as if the milky mountains range, with altar peak in the center, had suddenly become detached from the earth and were afloat in space, majestic, powerful and certain of its course. For three days thereafter, the master spoke no word to any man. Chapter 12 you will see in the next part too. And that's not all, our experts and regular viewers respond to all comments. Also check if you forgot to subscribe and set your bell to receive notifications about new audiobooks and other useful self-development materials that we release regularly. Join in the discussions, don't forget to give likes and, if possible and inspired, support the development of the channel financially. All useful links will be in the description and the first attached comment. Goodness love and wisdom to all. And now move on to watch the next part of the video at the links below or choose something from the playlists of the channel and those you see on the screen.